What's going on guys and welcome to a new episode of Spartan Ownership. Before you jump in, just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, Elliot Hulse has been an influence in my life since I've been about 17 or 18 years old. Um, he's been an influence in how I see masculinity, manhood, uh, you know, goal setting and training mentally and physically and the importance of not being in your head all the time and how important it is to get back into your body, breathe, to let go of your neurotic holding patterns, to let go of inner tension that, that just destroys our ability to live life authentically and from a grounded place. So yeah, we're going to get into a lot of different topics ranging from uh, exercises to get yourself more grounded uh, to how a man should move forward in his life in terms of goal setting, objectives. Uh, we're going to get into his transitions uh, because he used to be big into Eastern philosophy and spirituality and things like that. Now he's more into Christianity. And I'm seeing this a lot in like the manosphere. Uh, I'm seeing this in a lot of thinkers uh, and influencers uh, in the modern era is that there's this big move towards Christianity in a lot of them. So it's interesting to see what the thinking is behind that for some of them. And we definitely get into that. Uh, and then in the end, we ended on a pretty funny note, but a powerful one. So nice little surprise for you guys there. And yeah, let me know what you guys think about the interview uh, in the comments. And if you haven't already, subscribe to his channel. Check out his training videos. He has a bunch uh, ranging from sandbag training to yoga to weightlifting um, to uh, goal setting, all kinds of different things. So check out his work and enjoy. All right. What's going on, guys? Welcome to a new episode of Spartan Ownership. Uh, today, we obviously have a uh, special guest, Elliot Hulse. Thank you for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Um, I've been following Elliot for years. He's been definitely a big influence uh, in my development as a man. And one of the uh, frontline guys for this whole movement. So it's definitely an honor to, uh, to be here with him today. Um, and we're gonna go into some topics uh, and see how our minds merge for this podcast or interview or whatever you wanna call it. Um, yeah. So, ground, Grounding Man, that's mm -hmm. one of your main events, mm -hmm. right? And one of your, like, bigger topics are about being grounded, essentially. Bioenergetics, centering yourself, things like that. Um, like, wh why do you put such a big emphasis on, on being grounded? Well, when I say to be grounded is really to be based in your reality, being who you really are, uh, grounding yourself in truth. And so there are many different ways that you can go about that, but the bottom line is you're not living as a human being, especially as a man, if you're not grounded in principle, uh, virtue, uh, and those are the higher qualities, but then it boils down to the literal self, the body. You know, for us to even be able to accept certain ideas, our body has to be soft enough, relaxed enough, open enough to even accept it. That's why it's so easy to manipulate us through media because you're kind of in a passive state, but you're not, you're grounded because you're sitting on a fucking couch or something. You, but you're in a passive receptive state. That's a blank slate. To be grounded in self is to be grounded in your principles, grounded in your virtue, but open to uh, accepting, considering, uh, and applying new ideas, which is a complete opposite of what we're dealing with here today because today we got people that, when you are actively emotional, angry, uh, overly passionate um, you can't hear anything else besides your feelings and so a part it, 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 it's multifaceted but a part of being grounded is not being so moved 
by emotions that keep you trapped in thoughts that are probably not so resourceful. Right. Was that, that sounded complicated, but did you follow that? No, I did, I did. <laughs> um, it it kind of, it, it's basically about being centered um, so that you're not swayed by pain, by pleasure, by all these things, and you're kind of right. grounded in principle. And one thing I, I have a lot of trouble with is, is the, the physical part of it, right. um, the body part. Like, I guess, you know, being raised without a father, without any brothers, without anybody, I basically grew up in Queens, like, uh, kind of on my own like my mom single mom but she was always at work so I kind of had babysitters but they changed every freaking year or two right. so I felt like very ungrounded my whole life mm -hmm. you know and yeah I definitely still struggle with that today I definitely feel more grounded so part of what you experienced as a child growing up is a level of trauma mm -hmm. not to have your father is a trauma to be passed around from woman to woman as a babysitter is a trauma and here's the thing when it comes to the body and trauma. Sigmund Freud talks about defense mechanisms and that we develop certain, uh, you could call them characterological predispositions or psychoses. And, he, and he, he categorizes them, schizoid, oral, masochist, psychopath, phallic narcissist. Um, those are all mental strategies that help defend you against a, uh, a, 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 a an environment with a traumatic environment but it doesn't just happen in the mind it's not just a mental construct it's not just a way of thinking you actually take on the physical form of each one of those character structures according to Wilhelm Reich and so uh, a part of what we want to establish is not just a freedom of thought but a freedom to each one of those according to Reich each one of those uh, defense mechanisms form themselves in the body, but through one main active pulsation, which is called our breath. So, when you receive a trauma as a child, or you experience trauma as a child, in order, the, the, the first reaction as a defense mechanism isn't mental, it's physical. It's you stop breathing. You know, if you're afraid, you know, say like you had a, 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 an abusive parent. You're gonna you're gonna create mental strategies and maybe become a masochist or some you know one of the character structures, but that comes later in terms of your mental strategy. What comes first is the way you hold your breath. You can you can uh, hold back. You could hold up. You could hold in. These are different breathing defense mechanisms that ultimately form the physical posture. So what I'm saying is that in order to free yourself from the childhood trauma, we could talk all we want. We could talk circles around why that's unresourceful, why it's over, why it's no longer with you, why different ways you can choose to be. But if, as long as you're still breathing in the fashion of the defense mechanism against the trauma, breathing shallow, breathing, holding up, holding in, holding back, um, you're not grounded. Your body is still holding the trauma. There's a really good book called the, by Kellerman says uh, the body tells the story. Mm -hmm. The body, the, so the, basically the body tells you, uh, the body holds the remnants of your trauma. So you, we have to always address the breath. We have to always address the body. Yeah, um, no, that's, that's definitely key. And I've definitely been doing a lot of breath work and I talk about it on my channel. I, in fact, I interviewed um, Dan Brule. He's, he's like a breathing guy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely kind of into that. Um, but like what I noticed is that, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate, um, when you do bioenergetics and you do breathing and work and all this kind of stuff, like you feel more relaxed, but then you enter like a social situation or something like that, and all of a sudden you're like, you're back in your head, you're analyzing everything. You know, I definitely right. experience you that. Right, you revert back to the, to, the, to the defense mechanism. You get right. out of your body, you go right back into your head. The, the main way we escape trauma is by leaving the body. Mm. Leaving the body, going to our head. And we're taught in our world to, to, to conceptualize, visualize, idealize, and mentalize everything rather than being present in our instinct, in our intuition, in our body. So you could practice being in your body through deep breathing in safe uh, spaces. Because um, deep breathing, will, when you start accessing your full orgastic wave, which is the full breathing wave according to Wilhelm Reich, 
you're gonna bump up into physical representations of the trauma. And so a lot of times, the, you, if you practice long enough and with the right practitioner, you'll go through breathing sessions where you have cathartic releases. Mm. Ah, ah, trapped rage or <laughs> like trapped sorrow. You, you don't even have to know why it's there. You don't need to have a story why it's there. But the fact that now you're tapping it because you're breathing heavily, that stuff gets released. It makes you much softer. We, man, crying, I was talking to my dad about this this week he, and he gets it. He said, when you have a good cry, good sob, it's like an orgasm. It's a, and you're done, you're just like, oh. You're like relaxed, you're free, you feel good. You're more grounded in yourself. You're more stable in that way. When you're practicing deep breathing, but you're not releasing the trauma through catharsis or something like that, uh, you now are just you're just doing something with the breathing, which is good. That's how you get there. But then you go into a social situation that triggers the trauma, and then you go right back to the defense me mechanism. Yeah. Into my head, what are these people thinking? What's the right thing to do? What am I? How do I look like? What am I dressed like? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So we go right back into this, into the conditioning that has been our escape route, right? Uh, from actually dealing with ourselves. So that's what you're experiencing when you, you know, you're practicing your bioenergetic breathing, but then you get into a social situation, and, you, and of course, the path of least resistance. You've been doing it for 25 years, right? So you go right back to it. So it's a process. Yeah, like I've done a lot, like I pretty much do breath work every day now, at least for a few minutes, um, typically even 20 minutes or so, um, and meditation where I just try to center my attention because throughout the day, my attention is usually just freaking like a pinball machine in my mm -hmm. own head. And um, but what I noticed is that when I do a lot of breath work and things like that, there's like this sadness that I feel all the time. Yeah. You know, and I think that's kind of what you were talking about, like right. that. It's bumping up against something. Right, yeah. And when I do bioenergetics, and I do like cathart cathartic uh, release, I notice that, man, it's like nothing but anger yeah. the entire time. Anger is on the surface. Anger is a great emotion, and you need to have it because it activates. It's very uh, extroverted. It gets things done. Right. But it's very on the surface, and it's, our traumas are layered, or, or, or better, I, I would say, our responses to trauma is layered at the deepest core is softness. And softness is, is of the sadness that you're experiencing. When you feel that sadness, it's a softness, which in order for it to actually be released and let go, you have to melt into the softness. You can't cry, you can't sob, you can't make yourself sob. You can get angry and make yourself punch something, but to, to, to get to the deepest inner core of the, of, of, of the, the, the response to the trauma, which is often sadness, you actually have to let go. You have to soften up and have to let go. When you are mad and, sh and showing this, it's good, but it's covering up, it's hiding, it's an affront, and it's probably your most uh, predominant front to, or, or shield against your sadness. Because it's better, in my opinion, it's better to be mad to the world than to be sad to the world. Because when you're mad to the world, that means the world can't fuck with you. There's a, it, you're protecting yourself. Right. When you're sad, you're vulnerable. Right. And so when you go for that catharsis and you're releasing all that anger, understand that all the energy that's pent up and that you're releasing there is doing is two things. You're, uh, you're protecting yourself and it's your, it's your default protect mechanism, but you're also spilling off excess energy that wants to find a release. Mm -hmm. A more full release would be to break through the anger, which, just watch this, you know it's a pulsation. Everything in nature is pulsation. Blah! And then, <sighs> so you can push out so that you can break and then sink. I had this experience multiple times because I've worked with bioenergetic therapists, but the most, uh, the, the most prevalent in my mind was when I did a bioenergetic camp and I invited one of my uh, mentors. And during one of our sharing sessions, after deep breathing and drumming, it was fucking crazy, I had this big outburst, right? Because it was about sharing. And these people, they know what's up. So I shouted, I was angry. I put my fist through the wall. But no more than one minute after punching, my, punching the wall, I was in the corner in the fetal position crying like a little kid. So the anger, 
the anger's on the surface and you can use it as a breakthrough to finally get you into the softness. Because what you really want is softness. Mm. Yeah. Um, with that being said, I mean, so when, I'm, when I try to get grounded, um, I try to like, do you, do you center your awareness into your body? Like, you can do a lot of different mental strategy, yeah. centering your awareness, but the bottom line is it's purely physical. It's purely physical, and when I say physical, well, what, what is physical? Well, physical is energetic, because think about emotion. It's, it's energy moving in the body. We're, we're physical, but we're also energetic. We've got a soul, right? So, um, uh, and I'll give you a bit more context. Yeah. Like, and I know you're not into Osho that much anymore, uh, if at all, but, um, which I kind of want to get into as well, that transition. But like, I was reading one of his books the other day and it was like his meditation book. And, um, he spoke about like the Hara or, you know, this, the, the gut or oh, whatever yeah. you want to call it. And I understand. It, he said that like, when you meditate, um, you should sort of like try to try to get get into that space and he also mentioned how like um when you're doing something dangerous people like doing dangerous things because it centers them there uh without them even wanting to and right. he said if you if you set if you're centered there you kind of feel more blissful and these days i try to practice mm -hmm. just trying to like center here instead of being here i try to like go but remember lower. like i just said it's still a mental strategy okay by putting your attention somewhere what I'm saying, because I'm a strength coach, I work on the body, is that by merely breathing, by just doing the deep breathing into, it's not just breathing, it's breathing into your balls. Right. When I say breathing into your balls, it's breathing into your horror. That's exactly what it is. Okay. So you can't help but have mental focus on this area, but with the added benefit of, I'm just making sure I don't stop breathing. If I take you through, I could, maybe we'll do it, but if I take you through a bioenergetic breathing, uh, session you're going to get to a point two minutes in 20 minutes in where you start you stop breathing you're just you're just gonna you're not gonna go to your belly anymore the breath is just gonna start gonna become shallow you might even black out but one of the defense mechanisms against deep breathing or breathing into your balls is blacking out uh rationalizing starting to talk all those things need to be eliminated because they're, again, they're running to the head. Yeah. If you just, with no concept at all, no force of consciousness at all, or force of awareness at all, just keep fucking breathing, you're gonna hit something. Mm -hmm. And so when you actually hit that, when you breathe into your balls that long, Tara, long enough, and you access that, you hit that, You've broken a wall that's been built up. You can't access your hara because there's a wall around it. You, most guys can't breathe into their balls, no matter how much they think they're doing it because there's a wall around it, usually at the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor, most of our walls are the diaphragms. Throat, pelvic floor, feet. The, the diaphragm, the, the pelvic floor diaphragm has muscular tension that is energetic and, and, and psychic in nature. You know, it, it, you're holding, but you don't know you're holding. You're unconsciously holding your pelvic floor in. What I'm saying is that if you just focus on deep breathing into your balls, you get to the point where you, you bump up against that resistance in your pelvic floor, or for me, I, can, I do it a lot here, or in the throat, and someone, it's hard to do it by yourself. You usually need someone there saying, Keep breathing, breathing, belly, make your belly bigger, make your belly bigger. I always needed somebody to help me. I need a coach because I'm not aware enough. All great athletes have a coach because the coach knows what you're doing and what you can do and what you're not doing. So once you get to the point where you're in a deep breathing session and you break that, first time I broke the tension in my pelvic floor, I use a lot of personal examples so you know what I'm talking about. First time I broke the tension in my pelvic floor and actually breathed into my balls. I was getting a session from a practitioner who first she had me breathing, doing the bow. The bow is very important. Bow is very different than just normal deep breathing because the bow puts a stretch on the three diaphragms. You gotta have your feet set a certain way and then you put a stretch on your pelvic floor, belly, a stretch on your solar plexus and also stretch on your throat by doing this. It stretches those places that have tension. Right. First time I was able to, to break the tension in my pelvic floor, I was working with a practitioner who had me breathing like the bow, then she had me go face down on a mattress, 
grab the mattress, keep breathing. She had my toe, she had me dig my toes into the mattress, and she said, now start humping the mattress. That's what she told me to do. She said, suck your hips into it. So I'm here, it's gonna look crazy on video, but it is what it is. I'm here breathing and doing this. Sucking my hips into the mattress. Why was she having me suck the, my hips into the mattress like I'm fucking a mattress? Because she knew that there was tension here and if I was ever gonna be grounded, be relaxed, breathe into my balls, that needed some help. You know how we do myofascial self-release with a, with a foam roller yeah, right. or a ball? You could do the same thing with movement. And so she had me do a movement and the crazy thing happened, I'm here humping the mattress, breathing like a maniac, and within three minutes, I broke out into the type of laughter that I didn't experience since I was like seven years old. You know when you're a kid and you laugh and your belly hurts and it's uncontrolled, we can't stop laughing? Most adults, we don't get that anymore because we don't have access to the joy center. That's what this is down here. Right. She called it the joy center. She said, this is where you experience pleasure, uh -huh. of course. But we've been conditioned and traumatized not to experience that treasure, uh, that pleasure, which is a treasure. Right. So my point is that, uh, that breaking up the neurotic holding pattern, that's what the tension is, I call it a neurotic holding pattern. Breaking it up with deep breathing and movement, you, now here's what happened to me after having that happen. So you, you're, what you're wanting is to be able to carry this into your life. You're gonna meet with people, you wanna be able to still breathe into your balls. Bro, for at least a year, and even still sometimes to this day, after having sex with my wife, I break into that same type of laughter. Yeah. Because I have access to that joy center where I didn't for so many years. Right. Are you following me? Does this make sense? Does it fit in? No, definitely. Definitely. So, when you, when you, uh, okay, so, when you're grounded, uh, there are so many different things. It's a right complex now. topic. Yeah, there's it a lot is. going on here. It is. <laughs> like, throughout the day now that you've been doing all this training and everything, um, do you basically live from that place now? Like you're not, you, and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about you it. You don't have to actively live from that place. You're restored to your natural state. So you don't have to walk around trying to be aware. You're just aware yeah. because you don't have that those neurotic holding patterns and that tra trauma in your body any longer. So masculine energy is kind of low then, right? Well, we're talking about energy. We're talking about human being, human being, as as it is. When we talk about men, there are differences between men and women, right? But this is for all humans. Like when, when I, when I feel grounded, I feel like my energy is literally sunk. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels. Yes. But, but it's weird because like when I'm in a social situation sometimes and I'm in that state, that's where a lot of the conflict comes in because I want to be like social and communicate with other people and stuff like that. But when I'm grounded, I feel almost not that much desire to talk or anything. Right. And that's your natural state. You're yeah. probably a bit more introverted, more quiet, more reserved, more thoughtful than the world has taught us to be. I'm completely ungrounded right now and I'm talking from my throat mm. because I'm interacting with you. We're having a conversation. I'm putting on a performance. You see what I'm saying? So I'm up out of my core. Uh. And so it's because we've been conditioned the way we are to be so extroverted, to be students in class, to be the you that you believe and the world believes you are, the ego, it's our default to go back to the ego and then we rationalize why we're not acting like ourselves. So you're grounded, you're actually acting like yourself, but the ego is not as present. So you go and fetch the ego like, yeah. oh, I'm feeling grounded, but everybody's laughing and having a good time and they're all talking and they're into what's going on. I'm not, but <laughs> let me grab my ego, come back out of myself so that I can engage with the, yeah. with the people. A true master, which I am not, but a true master who's established this and, and, and walks his life this way would be in a social situation like that. And the crazy thing is, you have to experience it to know it and I've experienced this. You will be completely quiet. They're all having their conversation, but you will be fully present and acknowledged. One of my teachers says, like the sun. She says, the sun doesn't have to prove that the sun's there because the sun, by its mere virtue of rising and shining, warms the entire environment. Do you ever meet these people? And I've had instances where I was like this, you know, from practice and whatnot, where you're in a social circle, but it's the quietest guy, but it seems like he's leading the room. Mm -hmm. This guy is often the guy, and I'm giving you strategies, but a lot of this just comes naturally, the guy who is so quiet that when he talks, 
he could talk softly, everybody shuts up and listens. Mm. Because they recognize his presence. You gotta, it's no longer what you say or what you do or how you look when you're accessing your presence. It's your presence and people will feel your presence, especially in a world where most people are not present. Right. So you don't need to say anything in those, so give yourself permission. When you're feeling grounded and you're in those social situations, let the ego go for a moment because you know how to create separation, but just be present. Listen. You're, when you're yourself and you're in that low place, you're actually, you know, you talk about being masculine, but it's actually very passive because mm -hmm. you're receptive. And that's a very alpha male trait to be able to sit, list, sit quietly, listen, observe, uh, absorb without interjecting, without sharing your opinion, without saying anything unless asked. Right. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been defaulting to much more like recently, yeah. the past two years or so. Before I was way up here, but, but then there was so much friction because it's like I'm constantly in these social situations. So I've been drinking a lot more than I should because mm -hmm. it's like the only thing that, that kind of gets me out of my head enough to where and, and it, it kind of takes away that friction. Mm -hmm. I don't feel the need to be grounded anymore, and I'm just like. Throwing. Drugs and alcohol yeah. are great ways to reduce the ego's grip on you. And that's why they're so addicting. Right. <laughs> but when you'll get to a point where, and, it, and a lot of this is mental strategy also. So you want to use the body, but the mind is not separate. The ego doesn't go anywhere. We need an ego. It's our interface with the world. But keep putting the ego in check. Keep reminding yourself, oh, I feel like I have this angst to get up and talk and to make my pro point proven or to right. be seen. That's a big part of it, to be seen. Status, you know. Right. Yeah. But you get to a point where you're so comfortable in yourself that you don't need to be seen. And by the mere virtue of you not needing to be seen, you're seen more than anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. And one thing I've also experienced a lot is that when I'm kind of in that state and I'm trying to just stay grounded in a social situation I don't feel the need to talk or whatever almost everybody I know like thinks that I'm being super serious and right. like angry they think right. I'm angry they don't know how to categorize your presence that's the thing people are very uncomfortable with what they're not used to and so a person like you will step into the scene and they'll be like I feel something it feels weird to me they don't know what to do with it so they project it back on you and they're like, something wrong with that guy. Right. But really, they just don't know how to receive that, the, your presence. They don't know how to receive your energy. They don't know how to respect it, mainly because they never learned how to accept it in themselves. They don't know that that's there for them too. And so it becomes uncomfortable and then you become a weirdo. Huh. It's them, they're projecting on you saying, oh, you're mean. Right. I'm not mean, actually I'm very happy, I'm feeling very peaceful right now, I'm at one with you in this conversation and we're doing okay. Now, it sounds like you have some resistance, and what's that all about? And it's really about them. Right, yeah. And um, sometimes I, I would think that it was sort of like me disconnected from my, my, uh, my dark side or something, and, and when I'm grounded it kind of like comes up, it kind of bubbles up, but... There is a darkness to it. Right. There's a darkness to it. You ever study the dark triad? Yeah, like the psychopath and... Psychopath, narcissism, and there's another one I can't remember. Machiavellian. Machiavellian. So there is a darkness to it because think about what darkness is. Darkness is, is if you look at the yin-yang symbol, it's the feminine symbol. Black darkness is always associated with feminine. Blackness is also associated with receptivity mm -hmm. because it's empty. Whiteness, brightness is filled already. It's filled with light. Blackness is a openness, an availability, a passivity, which it, it fits in with the dark triad because if you're a psychopath, one of the, one of the, these, I don't, Wilhelm Reich talks about psychopaths, he talks about, which was where I get all these ideas from, psychopath, narcissist, and the Machiavelli, I'm not so sure about it, we can talk about it later, but the psychopath, one of the qualities of the psychopath is the need for control if it's an ungrounded psychopath. But when you're being quiet, you're actually receptive, and when you're receptive, you're in greater control. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, you're, but it's like you don't, you don't. It doesn't happen here. Like you no, don't, you don't know you're in control. Kind of get it. You get it. Yes, you actually just are in control. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's that's the part that I'm having so much fucking trouble wrapping my head around. Is like, and that's the problem. Because you I'm have conceptions to... about what control looks like. Like, see, for me, for example, I'm talking over you. I'm talking loud. Um, being extroverted. That is a form of control, but it's a surface level of control. And so most of us are hypnotized by surface level control. Titles, status, tone of voice, those are all very superficial. Mm. Real control is self-control. Self-control comes from stillness. Stillness, that's huge right there. That's huge. Um, yeah, and like, I guess a lot of this also, this work kind of helps men reconnect to that that dark side of themselves, that yes. inner monster and stuff like that. And a big friction point I see with that is like, I'm kind of worried about what would happen if I did that. Well, that's what the world wants you to do. You want they want you to be afraid of your power, yeah. and so you're a little worried about what's under there. But all that's under there is untapped into unaccessed and untransmutated or put out into the world energy. I have to use the word energy because it, it best describes what's going on in our body. So you're merely afraid of your own energy. It's really what it is. Anything that you have conceptually about what that energy may look like manifest is a byproduct of the fear that's been instilled in you uh, and the conditioning of your ego. There's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, we are more dangerous with untapped dark energy because it, it, it controls us from the underworld. It grows perverted. Yeah. So for example, if you acknowledge your sexuality, I'm a, a sexual being, I love women, I wanna have sex, and you acknowledge that, you're normal with it, you're restrained with it, meaning I respect this energy, I'm not gonna go and be a man slut, but at the same time, I'm not gonna deny it. I could fuck every woman in here. If I had the chance, maybe I would. That's very different. That's, that's acknowledging the dark energy with the opportunity to transmute that dark energy into something creative. When you deny that dark energy, either through uh, neurotic holding patterns or mental strategy, it stays in the shadow. And, it, and what happens is it grows perverted in the shadow because it has nowhere else to go, so it turns in on itself. And when I say it turns perverted, it gets tainted, namely with all kinds of demonic ideas and behaviors. So for example, I am a man who has the same sexual prowess, same feeling that I talked about before, same guy, except I denigrate that part of myself, I hate that part of myself, I push it down and pretend it doesn't exist, and then I'm a rapist. Mm. Right. Now, when the lights are out and nobody's looking and there's a woman over there, I'm gonna go and take her. As opposed to it being normal, <sighs> yeah, I'd love to fuck you, but it's not the right time or the right place, plus I'm married. You see the difference? Right. It's trans even transmuted into a little bit of uh, comedy you, you, because you're light about the energy. It uh -huh. comes out. It can it can be used. I get that with a lot like a lot of times with other men because like like I said I kind of grew up <clears throat> not very comfortable with my, with my masculinity and stuff and it's only recently very slowly been becoming more integrated. But like still when I'm around other men and stuff I notice that there's like this and I've had this struggle since I was like 12 years old. But I've always been like pushing my my aggression down and I think it has to do with the fact that I was bullied and stuff a lot back mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. Because I never felt grounded, so I was an easy target. And, like, I kind of basically spent my time in my head and, like, disconnected from that side. Because I was always afraid of, like, like this, this guy is pissing me off. This guy is trying to beat me up or whatever. And I'm like, fuck, i got to put that shit back because, you know, I, I don't want to, like, face off with the guy. Then you become a coward. Yeah. And so we're moving around this conversation a lot. But in terms of your mental strategy... We, I like to refer to the work of Carl Jung, and he talks about being able to access the four ways of being for a man, king, warrior, magician, lover. We'll talk about that later. But what you're talking about is purely associated with your inner king. 
And so here's what happens when you're in that type of situation. Robert Moore says that if you scratch a tyrant, you'll find a coward. And the reason why some people are tyrants is because they haven't, they don't know how to be assertive, so they become aggressive, and that's ugly. Mm. So they push it down, I said it backwards, they push it down into cowardice, and he says, wherever there's a coward, you scratch a coward, he says, you'll find a tyrant. I said it backwards before. Oh, okay. Scratch a coward, you'll find a tyrant. Because you're, you're in the two unresourceful poles of the king energy. There's a third pole accessing the, the, the true king. But the two, the two poles of the uh, unresourceful or shadow sides of the king are the tyrant, which nobody wants to be and nobody likes, and the coward, which nobody likes and nobody wants to be either. It's a bad place to be. So in, in, in a place like that, where you're at, this is why I spoke about virtue before. Virtue is so important because to be a tyrant is full of bad virtue. There's no virtue in being a tyrant. There's using that, that superficial control that we were talking about before. And that doesn't, really doesn't serve in most instances. But the world admires it. That's how you become a president. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the coward, where you're the impotent king. You're the weakling king. You got the tyrant and the weakling. In the middle, there's access to virtues that allow you to, to, buy, to rise above both those polarities. One of the ways that a virtue, a, a kingly virtue can be described that will pull you out of that is the practice of assertiveness. Right. Assertiveness is calm aggression. Meaning, okay, this guy is doing something I don't like. Inside me, the tyrant wants to tear his face apart. <laughs> On the outside of me, my ego is like cowardice. Mm -hmm. The third option is, hey brother, I really appreciate you. I can see where you're coming from. I like your style even. You remind me a lot of yourself. But I gotta tell you that I do not appreciate when you come at me with that particular thing that you just said. And so, would you be willing to refrain from saying that to me? Would you be willing to cease in that direction when you're dealing with me. I, don't, I will not tolerate that. I don't tolerate that. We could be cool, but if you continue down this route, I'm gonna get up and leave. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? That's called assertiveness. That makes people uncomfortable too because there's a tint of aggression to it, but you have to learn how to tap into your aggression through the warrior, and that's a wholly different topic. So you gotta be able to tap into a, a little bit of aggression, but, but temper it with the groundedness that says, here's where I am, here's where you are, Here's the boundary, let's play fair. Yeah, like when I, the more time I spend kind of like putting that away, the more it becomes this thing where I'm like, shit, now if I release it, it's gonna come out ugly. Right, you never wanna get to that point. That's why you wanna squash shit right away when you're dealing with people. And you, you can do it, it's, it can be done in a fun way, a, 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 a laughing way. Uh, it could be, in, you decide, that's what transmutation is all about. I'm, Observing this guy, if I say something to him, he might get his feelings hurt and lash out at me the way he is, and then I'm just gonna have to deck him. I'm gonna have to take him out, <laughs> right? Because protecting yourself, there's no other way to protect yourself than to fight back. Right. So you observe this dude. This is where being grounded helps you observe someone. You observe, oh, I see what kind of guy this is. Let me get on his level. And this is where you get, you get, you get clever. This guy wants to be in charge. This guy wants to be seen. This guy wants to be the quote unquote king in this area and I see what you bully, you know what I'm saying? This is what a bully is. Right. Mental strategy or or even better, I would say a character strategy of a king would be to say, I notice everybody respects you. And I like your style. Acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. He's another psychopath. That's a psychopath. Psychopaths want to be acknowledged. He's a tyrant king. Hey, I respect you. I respect you too, bro. I see everything that you did there. It's pretty cool. I gotta make you aware of something though. I will no longer tolerate X, Y, Z. And you know, you're cool being you, and I know all these people respect you. I respect you too, but you can't cross that battle. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Do you think that like, a man that's been blocking that for a long time has to go through like a period, it could be weeks, months, or whatever, where that energy kind of spills out of him for a while? And like, cause that's kind of my, the thing with me is like, I'm just, sometimes, I'm definitely becoming more and more comfortable with it. It's you. two steps. Okay. There's two steps. Spilling, the only time anything should ever be spilled out, which means it's unconscious, is during a safe environment, 
safe space of containment with a ritual elder. Some, you're going through a process. We're doing bioenergetics. You're, going to, you're in a session. That's the only time unconscious stuff can resourcefully be spilled out. Because now you're shouting, but you're not shouting at anybody. Well, what, I, what I meant was more like, because you're so not used to using or like acknowledging that part of yourself and communicating it, it just doesn't come out with like right. eloquence. That's why I'm saying there's two steps. I just wanted to address the spilling thing. Okay. There's two steps. The first step is what we were talking about in the beginning. You gotta be grounded in yourself. You gotta be breathing into your balls. You gotta be relaxed, but active. You see what I'm talking about? You gotta be fully present because you can't do, every action is measured by the sentiment from which it proceeds. According to, uh, uh, that's um, uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Every action is, mentored from, uh, is measured by the sentiment from which it proceeds. Your sentiment is either anger, madness, calm. And so the first thing is that energetic dynamic of, I'm cool right now. I'm not, I'm not emotional about this right now. You have to establish that because everything that comes after that is based on that foundation. So the first thing you gotta do is to come to peace with yourself and come to peace with the circumstance. The second thing you do, and this is where this is where you can now use the brain in a more resourceful way. All right, I'm cool with myself. I'm cool with what's going on. I have no feeling about this. When you talk about spilling out, that's that's feeling, and then it just comes out. We don't want, it, and that's unconscious. We don't want any spilling. We want access to self, and then I acknowledge that I'm there's there's a level of anger that's coming up here. I'm gonna let that go. I'm gonna come back into my presence. I'm going to be rational about the circumstance. I'm going to look at what's going on and then I'm going to formulate a statement. This is like your sword or your shield. This is where you start accessing the warrior. So I'm going to formulate a statement. I have no emotions about what's going on right now, but I just need to make you clear that I have a boundary here and you've continued to cross it and I'll no longer tolerate it. That's all. Right. So you are not emotional about it, nothing's spilling out, you're completely present with yourself and the circumstances, and now you're just using your brain. The warrior is associated with the brain. The warrior is associated with the brain, meaning let me pull out my sword of discernment. Mm. What does a sword do? A sword separates that which is no longer useful into what is useful and continues to slice down until I get to the bottom of this. Hey buddy, it looks to me like, and you know you come from you're, what you notice about the circumstances, looks to me like I need to say something to you right now about this. Mm. That's all it is. It should be free from emotion. Right, right. And I, I kept having this um, image pop into my mind when you were talking about this, um, of a video where you, it, it must have been a recent one. It was back when you were doing a lot of fasting. You might not remember this one. Um, but I remember you were like standing and you were like, you were like, I ain't scared no more. I ain't scared no more. Mm -hmm. And you were just saying that. And that always hit me for some reason, mm -hmm. like really hard on an unconscious level. Yeah. And like, what was that about? Like, do you remember that particular so, sense? No, I don't remember it. But what I showed you there is what I talked about in terms of being in a container. Do that at home. Do that. Look, if you're a boxer, do it in the, in the, in the uh, locker room before you go out and fight. That's fine. Right. But that's not something that like you're gonna you're having a confrontation with a dude and you go, I ain't scared of you, I ain't scared of you, I ain't scared of you. That's that's ungrounded. Do that later, like if you were thinking about the circumstance and you didn't step up for yourself, look in the mirror and you you go do that. But when it's time for action and you're in the battle, that's not gonna really serve you because mm -hmm. you're not gonna be. When you're emotional or when you're driving up emotion, which is resourceful for the letting go of it in those spaces, they say your prefrontal cortex, you got like a 30% reduction of brain capacity. When you're in like uh, adrenaline rush, you know, you're, you're scared, adrenaline rush, you know, you're in a circumstance. They say like, I'm learning how to, uh, how to protect my home. I'm doing home invasion training with some coaches and with guns. He says, the very first thing that you gotta do if there's an invader in your home is you gotta calm down, think rationally. Don't go grab your gun, run into the door, and shout. He says, Give it a, take your time. So that when you get there, 
you're using your full brain to access the circumstance. Because if I show up with a bad guy in my gun and I got 30% brain capacity, I'm probably not gonna aim right, I'm gonna probably do something stupid. This is where people shoot themselves in the foot. You see what I'm saying? Right. So the whole idea is, and this is a very, this is huge in terms of mommy daddy stuff. When we live in a world that's gynocentric, mommy ruled, boys become emotional. That's why boys are so much more dangerous in our world today. Toxic masculinity is men that are raised by boys who are over emotional because they behave like women. Women are given free pass to be emotional. Men, we are not. But when you live in a culture and you're raised with only mothers and you live in the world that's gynocentric, you're taught to feel your feelings, speak your passion, you're taught to, to get into the emotion of things. That's not the way our ancestors taught men to be and it's not the most resourceful way to men to be. What's resourceful for men is to see, experience, acknowledge emotion, but rise out of it so that we can use our full fucking brain. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, society being gynocentric and all, I mean, just working at, I had several jobs before, you work for you know, a company or whatever, and I feel like I, I live in that kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm not being myself, I'm not being a man, I'm not, I'm worried about like saying something that's gonna offend somebody or, it's just annoying. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to live more from that place, like wherever I go now, mm -hmm. and like just embrace it, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Mass, you're, you're thinking, you're trying to think like a man. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, thinking, behaving like a man is not default. It doesn't come naturally, especially in a mommy-centered, gynocentric world. Mm -hmm. Because the media, the music, the other girls, other boys, school teachers, mommy, all imprint femini feminization for you as a boy. All of us, myself included. Masculinity has to be taught. You come from your mommy, so you have your mommy's print in you, every single one of us. We naturally come out like women, as boys, because we have mamas, even her heartbeat we were listening to. We're very much in beat with our moms. Mm. But there comes a point in a boy's life where he needs to be able to look up and recognize, okay, that's mommy, that's daddy. I'm a boy, what's daddy up to? And when he starts to move in that direction, is introduced into the world of men, atonement of the father. Then he gets to leave behind the baby boy, the emotional boy, the blue pill boy, the beta boy. And he gets introduced into the ways, the stories, the honor of being a man. This all has to be transferred from older men, wise men, elders into young men. But in a world that hates the father, in a world that has done away with the father, in a world that not only our earthly fathers are weak, but our connection to the father is absent, you have no other choice but to be a materialized, matriarch-focused mama's boy. We need men again, in particular fathers. Right, and I think this is a good transition uh, to some of the transitions that, you, that you've made so obviously I've been following you since I was probably 16 or 17 like I remember I went to college for a year and I was I was putting people onto you and we were doing bioenergetics and stuff in the dorms and then I would go out and like interact with everybody I, I feel much better and um, but back then you were like more into Osho you were more into these different kinds of things and you were you came out with videos about like don't trust science don't trust religion things like that mm -hmm. and then now you're kind of heading towards um, Christianity more, and also, you know, Paul Check is one of your one of your mentors, and a lot of his stuff is about, you know, this kind of integrated stuff where you take a lot from different religions and you put it into one. And you know, um, I saw that video where, where you were with Paul Check. Uh, I think your wife was there, and you guys were doing stones, like, and and he was kind of. I think he was challenging you a little bit because he was like, oh, uh, he said some kind of remark like why do you need a daddy or something like that? And he was referring to like religion, you know? So I'm just curious, like basically what is, what is this force moving through right now, moving you in this direction? Why did you transition yeah. sharply like this? Plainly said, 
I've moved from the world of the mother into atonement with the father. What is that? That is the basic formula for init male initiation cross-culturally. All cultures, there's a lot of documentation of the Native American, particularly the Cherokee culture, in their way of initiation for men. My brother was a Native, he did a Native American initiation when he was in college too. And the process is, like I said, cross-culturally, you remove the boy from the presence and the energy of the mother. Literally, you gotta take him out of the home, and they take you off to, in the middle of the jungle somewhere, up on a mountain somewhere. And there is, an, there is a rites of passage, an initiation process, by which that boy now becomes atoned with the men, the fathers and the father. I have been blessed enough to not have too many scars with regard to the father. I don't have a lot of trauma with regard to the father. Paul, he didn't know his father. He had an abusive stepfather. He loves his mommy. What you see there between Paul and I is a man who's still trapped in the mommy mindset and a man who's given up the mommy mindset and is atoned with the world of the father. I have a strong father. And I also was given instruction on and a direction towards the father. Not sure Paul has had that and damn sure, not sure, and damn sure most men in our culture have not had that. They're still caught in the matrix. The word matrix comes from maternity, mother. Matrix has everything to do with fe gynocentrism, feminism, and the occult. Mm -hmm. The occult is wrapped up in the matrix and the material world mindset view of things, the gynocentric world. You're asking me about my movement from occult to the God of the Bible, the Father, patriarchy. I would even put it this way. What you see me moving from is occult gynocentrism, and I could tell you, I could talk about the history of that and why that is, into patriarchy, the world of the Father. And before you, you go on, I do, I do want to add this in for some context. You know, I, I was baptized Russian Orthodox, but I kind of grew up Catholic or went to Catholic school, whatever, but didn't really go to church or anything. Um, when I got into a lot of this occult, new age stuff, Osho, meditation, all this stuff, the the one thing I liked about it was that it emphasizes a lot of exper experience. Like, it's, you know, it's about, like, meditating and kind of experiencing it for yourself and things like that. Yeah. And I found a lot of, like, peace in that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't see it as quickly or, you know, the mystical aspect is... I don't see it sometimes in, in Christianity. Good. Things like so that. what we, right, I'm following you because I'm with you, 100%. Mm -hmm. I love this stuff. I love the occult. I love experiences. I love everything you said. Mm -hmm. That's why I was drawn to Paul. That's why I'm drawn to chakras. I'm drawn to astrology. I'm drawn to all kinds of new age ideologies. It's very appealing. It's very, how can I say this? It's very much associated with the pleasure of being in the mommy world. Mm -hmm. Experience uh, gives us pleasure. Um, novelty, and it, a, 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 a transcendent experience is why everybody's using mama ayahuasca. You know, they, I wanna drink the juice and have the experience. Mm -hmm. All very effeminate. Those are all very effeminate because it's hankering for a drug, for a feeling, for a, a fix. The world of the father is is a different ball game than the effeminacy associated with the pleasure that comes from experience, novelty. The world of the father is spiritual. It's detached from your feelings, it's detached from your emotions, it's detached from your thoughts, and it's detached from effeminate necessity for novelty. But I get it because this this necessity for novelty and experience and feeling and transcend all that which is a part of the matrix is so very appealing it's so gratifying it, it, it gives us power it fulfills our hankering it fulfills our addictions it gives us something because I call it mental masturbation 
But there's a pleasure associated with thinking about chakras and thinking about levels of spirituality and thinking about this movement of the stars. All that feeds the ego. There's, there, there's a pleasure associated with that. The world of the Father transcends all of that. The world of the Father is colored by faith. Not knowing, not feeling, and not doing anything. When you go back to Carl Jung, which he's a lot of occult stuff, I'm into it, that's how I understand and, and explain the world. It gives me words, I'm happy that I was in a cult because it helped me to understand where I'm at and what, how this whole thing works. But when you, when you break down Carl Jung's quadrated psyche, he says that the psyche is broken down into four parts. So we come from God into a psyche, into a body, or a soul into a body. There are four parts. You could, you're thinking, you're feeling, you're doing, or you're being. Mm. When you're wrapped up in a cult, you're thinking, reading more books. You're feeling, I drank this potion, and bah, I got this feeling. I feel euphoria, I feel great. You're doing, You're doing all kinds of shit. It's very sexy, it's very appealing. It gives us something for our three lower bodies, our three lower qualities to engage in. It keeps us distracted. That fourth quality, being, is associated with the king, the crown, the father. Being sounds very mystical. If you, if you consider thinking, feeling, being, doing, thinking is magician, you're, you're, you're feeling something, or you're doing something. Warrior, you're thinking something, you're doing something. Lover, you're thinking something, you're doing something. King, it's being. King is the, be is the being quality. That is far more mystical than the mental masturbation and the emotional turmoil of playing with all this esoteric stuff, but it doesn't give us the, the, the earthly pleasure. Being is literally resting in the love of the Father. Can you let it all go and rest in the love of the Father. You know what we talked about before earlier about being in your presence? Mm -hmm. When a man is atoned with the Father and he's simply being, he's in an environment, he doesn't have to say anything, he doesn't have to do anything, he doesn't have to think anything, he just is. That sounds, to me, if you wanna get into a conversation about mysticism and mystical, this shit sound like baby games. It sounds like masturbation compared to accessing your being. Right, but like when you meditate, and there is a kind of emphasis on being in some of these Eastern religions and things like that. I like, I get where you're going. Yeah. I don't like the word meditation anymore because it's wrapped up in too much mystical religion, occult BS. In the Bible, God tells us, be still and know. A person who's being still and knowing, if you look at him, looks like he's meditating. Right. I want to say, and I'm just throwing this out there, I'm talking shit, that uh, occult mystery religion co-opted the, the, the way of being that the Father has given us and gave it a cool name, meditation, and gave it cool uh, rules and things to do. When a man is simply being, he's always meditating. That's what meditation is a, is a gateway drug to being. So you can play around with the drug, you can play around with the parameters, you can pay, play around with the time-space continuum that says at 7 a.m. every day I'm gonna do this for 20 minutes, or you get to the point where you can drop all that. Even Osho, I, I still love Osho. Osho says, meditation is designed to get you to drop meditation. This is what he says. He says the only reason we meditate is so that you can stop meditating. Right. Because you get to the point where you don't need the training wheels anymore, and you just be it. So being is is that inner stillness, and but like when you practice something like sitting just for twenty minutes or whatever, isn't that a way to get into atonement with the Father? It's practice. It's good practice. It's good practice, that's, and that's one way to get there. So a masculine practice. What what would be a good masculine practice? If it's not going to be all this new age. So, right. Good. Let's come from underneath and move upwards. All the occult stuff, but let's use meditation as a gateway. Because you're right. Everything you're saying, I agree with. So we move from the, 
all, because you can get wrapped up, I had so many books about different occult stuff, into I'm just going to practice being. I'm going to go into meditation. Now here's the thing. When you allow yourself to simply be, you're free from thought. You're free from judgment. You're free from feeling. You're allowing yourself to be. Meditation will help you get there. But it is unresourceful for man to have a blank slate up here. This is why when our ancestors took boys out of the home, away from the world of the mother, and introduced them into the world of the father, one of the things they would have them do is, quote unquote, get them into a meditative state, but then start bombarding their consciousness with the stories, the myths, the religion, the meaning, the purpose, all the values, the virtues, character, have to be now, like you got, think about a computer, you wipe the hard drives clean with meditation. You got out of all this shit, you don't need it anymore. You realize you don't need it anymore. You go into meditation, you access your being, now with that clean slate, it's my opinion, it's my belief, that you now need instruction on the right way to be. And there, you go to the Bible. You go to the myths of man, the stories of man, the meaning of man, what it means to be a man. Okay, so it seems like... That has to be instilled, like I said earlier. Right, right. Um, it seems like you basically retained certain things from the Eastern realm, but like you basically just took the fruit and spit out the seeds. Like you're no longer in the mental masturbation stuff, but you understand the value of things like stillness, sitting, just Good. being away from all these things. All this stuff, yeah. I spit out the fruit, I like what you said there. All that stuff was a gateway drug for me to finally allow myself to be. What this, I like to call this occult stuff, and, and I can talk about the, where occult comes from, I, you know, I'm into this stuff right now, where it comes from, why it's there, how we got introduced to it. I like to call it hacking God. There's truth in all the occult stuff. There is truth, but it is a minor truth to the, to the ultimate truth, the absolute truth. It's a minor truth because it's training wheels. It's helping me to, I'm into astrology and I'm into cosmic consciousness and the movement of the stars as it relates to the path of a man's life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I love this stuff. But really, it's a, it's, a, it's a framework, it's training wheels to ultimately get you to stop all that stuff. Osho is in here and Osho, Osho transcends because Osho teaches you dynamic meditation. <laughs> ah, all that shit. But ultimately, when you get deep into Osho, he tells you, all that shit is just to get you to stop that shit. Right. Now, you can simply be. And so, when you say, I, I, I took pieces of the occult, I did because it, it helped me get to the point to where I can leave it all behind. And even meditation, I throw it all behind. Doesn't mean that I don't meditate. I tell my students, we're thrown in. Mm -hmm. Sit on your throat, sit in throne a king sits on his throne so it's it, you could call it meditation but I don't like that word because it's too wrapped up in the occult right it's not that I'm not meditating it's not that I don't abdicate for being still and knowing but I don't want to call it that and I lump that in with everything else that essentially at this point in my life I'm setting aside so so when you're throning are you just is that like a practice you just you're just sitting this Throning is a little different than meditation, depending on the meditation that you're doing, because there's so many different types of fucking meditation. Right. When I tell my men to throne, what I'm telling them to do, and I'll go from the negative rather than the positive. Okay. I'm telling them, observe objectively your thoughts and do not engage. Observe objectively your feelings, but do not engage. Observe objectively your impulses, but do not engage. See them, but allow them to pass. Be. Be. Right. So do you identify as consciousness, as awareness, or do you kind of, you don't even think about it, about it that way? I don't even think about it. But awareness is seeing, watching. Be, you want to be a watcher. You could call that consciousness who you want, but Osho talks about it and it's in the Bible. Be still and know means be still, 
and just observe. Because it kind of helps like to think about it, at least for me, and, and I know it's big in the Eastern stuff. They say that you are not your body, you're not your mind, you're just the awareness of it. So do you consider yourself like the silent observer? Is that your soul? Yes. Okay. The silent observer. And then how do you integrate the fact that a lot of Christianity, especially these days, the ways that it's kind of marketed, has sort of a feminine element to it? It's here. 90% of Christianity today is occult Christianity. Catholic, I don't know much about, I know about the Orthodox from their writings, but I don't know where the church is. The Catholic church is, is run by pedophiles, communists, and, uh, and Satanists. I mean, they're all, they're following occult, they use occult symbols. The American Christian church, all the, all the uh, Protestant denominations, they're all, they're all in this occult in a different way, but it's all occult stuff. The entire church has been invaded by postmodernism, which is ruled by the occult. You know that it's part of the reason why you know that it's that this uh, the church is ruled by the occult, mainly the Catholic Church, because I've done my research into it, is because the Freemasons. I'm not knocking any Freemasons, but of the higher level Freemasonry has completely infiltrated the church post the assassination of John Paul the First. Every pope. Just like every American president after Woodrow, I think it was Woodrow Wilson, uh, 1918, I think it was 1918, 1914, the, the Federal Reserve Bank, every single president after him was basically a pawn to the Federal Reserve Bank. Trump might be the first that wasn't, and Kennedy was trying not to be, and they killed his ass. Every pope since the assassination of John Paul I has been installed by the uh, Freemason, you could go a little higher, call it the Illuminati if you want, but it's where these occult ideas come from. That's the church of today. It's an occult church. It's, it, we're in apostasy. We've fallen away from God and we are, just look at the Pope today. Our Pope is fully bought into postmodernism. He's a communist, but you gotta, you gotta take it for its wounds. Just like, you know, the, the church is the bride of Christ. We know women. You might have a bride one day. She can get led astray. She can make mistakes. You know, big mistakes, small mistakes. But the same way that Jesus gives the example of loving the church regardless. You know, he gave his life and I love the church even though the church is full of fucked up people. And it, I use that analogy for how you would deal with your wife. I still love the church. I still love Jesus and his established church. I like some of the denominations, but I also understand that it's been led astray and it's wrong. Right. So the image of Jesus that we have today is in your eyes kind of like perverted? Depends on, there's so many denominations. You know, because it's like this guy that's like, you know, he's, you know, a lot, I'm sure you've heard the criticisms, like the, it's kind of, you know, turning the other cheek and all these kinds of things, you know, and this big emphasis on forgiveness and all this kind of stuff. And even how he's portrayed in like movies and things like that, he's usually wearing a robe, he's kind of more like gentle, mm -hmm. you know, like, what is that? Like, how do you, that, you know? Do you, do you remember I was talking about a man that's accessing his king and he's being fully present? The way you can be? Some people might call that Christ-like. Jesus is the example of the perfect king. The perfect king is like I described in many different ways, detached. So when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, he basically is saying, don't get emotional, don't get caught up, be detached. There's a really good uh, story about a, 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 a Japanese swordman, samurai swordsman, I think it's Miyato Mushushi or some shit like that, where he's the greatest sword fighter in the province, right. probably all of Japan, and he's challenged by a lesser opponent. A man comes to him and says, you were supposed to be the best, well, I'm gonna fight you. I wanna fight you. This guy knowing that he could fucking whoop his ass is like, I'd rather not. Let's, you know, let's figure out another way. This guy, the opponent, spits in his face. 
hang on, I got it. I got a little bit backwards. Okay. They're about to fight, and the and the guy is trying to avoid it, but he's like, all right, fine. This motherfucker wants to fight. I'm gonna fight him. You know, it comes to a point where okay, I gotta fight him. So they both pull out their swords. This guy spits in his face. He spits in his face, and the sword master puts his sword away and walks away. Doesn't fight him. One of his students comes to him later and says, "Why didn't you fight that guy after he spit in your face?" The sword master says, "Because I was angry." after he spit it in my face. Mm. He was moved, he was emotional, he was ungrounded. Don't take any action based on, you know, every action measured by the sentiment from which it proceeds. Don't take any actions out of anger. Don't do anything. So if somebody comes and slaps you, what Jesus is saying is, okay, I'm unmoved. You can maybe take my other cheek. I guess he's saying like, be that courageous. But the whole point Jesus is trying to make is, to be detached from the matrix, detached from the material world. My kingdom, the Father's kingdom, is above all of this. Right. So it gives you room not to always have to defend yourself. That's what Jesus being humble is about. Mm. Jesus being humble, humility in Jesus, is about not needing to constantly defend yourself because your faith in a higher kingdom. Jesus is willing to be humiliated, just like that sword fighter was willing to be humiliated because he understood that there's a higher plane of, of being. That's a tough pill to swallow, you know? I'm buying guns, I see BLM and Antifa out there, if they were in my house, I gotta protect my family, I'm shooting motherfuckers. I'm not Jesus. Right. But what Jesus is saying is, be so detached that, fine, you wanna, right. you wanna do this? That's okay. I'm not gonna back down, slap me in my face, I'll stay right here, because I am firm in my being and in faith of the Father and His kingdom. I think this is a perfect uh, segue into, I guess, the third and maybe final aspect of this interview. Um, I mentioned how, like, recently I've been getting into this guy named Nassim Taleb, mm -hmm. um, and I know you haven't really went into his work or anything, mm -hmm. but, like, a big thing that he talks about is how, like, one of, the, one of his top quotes, to give you an idea of kind of his mindset, is, I just want to live happily in a world I don't understand yes because and he's orthodox right and his whole um, like a lot of his work is about the limits of human knowledge and how we can't know every right. thing we can't plan for everything and how you know you gotta you, you kind of have to be okay with the complexity of the situation and his whole thing is like life is not linear right it's non-linear and that's why I really feel like it complements what you, what you talk about because a lot of a lot of what you talk about is not just being in the fucking head and trying to analyze everything and instead trusting different forms of inner knowledge your body things like mm -hmm. that um where was I going with this <laughs> I just got wrapped up in in that whole uh, mm -hmm. the only way yeah. you could be that is with the supernatural virtue of faith that's what I was going to say you brought that up earlier like this, all this occult stuff is about knowing, right? And then you said that the man, being a man, and like the more the father, the atonement with the father and everything is about faith, right? There's not knowing. There's no knowing. Yeah. There's no knowing, and there's no need to know, with regard to the father. So, and 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 the reason, our need to yeah. know comes from the story of Adam and Eve in the in the garden. It dates that far back because the serp serpent comes to Adam's wife and says be able from this tree of good and evil you will have the knowledge of God you'll be able to see God and from that day all forward we've been hankering for knowledge mm. what God is telling Adam or told Adam not to eat from that tree you're gonna get addicted to that fucking fruit just rest in knowing that I am providing everything for you in this garden right and and the reason why I brought up the the whole linear versus nonlinear thing is because um, like when you live in this faith-based way, things don't happen in like a logical sequence anymore. Right. And it's it's weird. It's like I've been trying to live my life like that uh, more and more. Like right now, I might be moving to Eastern Europe and all this stuff, and I don't really know what the fuck I'm doing yet with my career. Like mm -hmm. I kind of tried a bunch of different things, and like, you're allowing like, yourself to be led by the Father. Right. Yeah. So is that like a thing? Like when you tap into that, you no longer like spend so much time planning right you're kind of more like an intention but you're not you have less judgments you have less analyzing other things you have less mental masturbation 
it's like less just mental activity. Less just, stress, less chaos. Jordan Peterson likes to talk about how women, rep the feminine represents chaos and the masculine represents order. Right. You're living more in order. You're living in the kingdom. The kingdom is purely about order, but it's a divine order. When you're trying to rationalize everything, you're trying to use formulas for shit, you're trying to work it out, you're working in the lower kingdom. You're working in the chaos. You're trying to make order out of chaos. You're never gonna do it. You're just masturbating. You're wasting your time. How many times, I know I have, I've worked out plans. I'm watching my daughter do it right now. She wants something. And she's working out all these plans. Me, the father, her father knows, you're wasting your time, but I won't let you be, right? You're right. wasting your time because it, it, you can't see that far ahead. And it's not necessary to see that far ahead. Let all that shit be. And when you're present, you, one of my teachers says, allow it to come to you. You sense that you want something, something's coming. I like to think when I have those senses, it's just a foreseeing. I don't, it's not an impulse to go get it. Mm. It's, oh, this might be coming. This might be on its way. We'll see what happens. And then let it, if it's true, come to you. Or another way is to allow it to unfold. There's an allowing, there's a give, giving up. There's a passivity towards the strength of the Father. Right. Trust in the Father. Yeah, I, I used to like, a lot of my viewers know this. I'm, um, I used to be a huge proponent of like waking up in the morning, having a purpose. Yeah. Like reading this whole freaking document with like my vision and all this crap. Like I took a Tony Robbins course. And yeah. It was like, create your category of improvement and all this yep. kind of stuff. I've done all that shit. Ready. All right, great. So, little cut out there. I'll edit that out. Um, okay, so we were talking about linear. Oh yeah, categories of improvement. I used to spend all this time doing that. You say you do you do that too. So, what do you? How do you like move forward now? Like, what's your newfound balance on all this? Like on planning and how to live. Yeah. How do you move forward? How do you set goals? How do you do all that now? How do you live? So. You can be caught up in this whirlwind of chaos, trying to make sense of it, trying to piece it together, trying to do it. Or you can rest in the Father. Those are the two, the two things. Rest in God or take it upon yourself, your own ego and your, uh, and your mystical religion, occult stuff. Do that. And, and that's what Tony Robbins is all occult stuff. That's all occult stuff. Mm. Any God hacking, any life hacking is, in my mind, categorized as occult. Trying to, because I did all that stuff and it works. Calling out your plans, having your affirmations, all that shit. Because it, Manifesting. Right. In essence, you're trying to grab the steering wheel from God and say, uh, this is what I want and I'm going to make it go that way. That's right, right. in a way. And there's, it can, it can work. Sometimes better than others. But what do you do when you let all that go? How do you live your life and get anywhere? Right? If you're resting in faith, you're resting in the Father. You've come home, you've atoned with the Father. Well, first of all, you can't get there unless you have faith. And if you have faith to let go, you do and act upon what's revealed to you. Revelation isn't as mystical as it sounds. Revelation is a sensitivity towards what's right in front of you. So more present moment. Very present moment. So instead of thinking, I had, an, I had a call with my nephew yesterday. My nephew's in the Marines. He's been in the Marines a, a year now. Uh, and he's doing great. He just got, uh, he just got, when his rank went up, he got uh, promoted. Yeah. So now he's in a managerial position. He was a grunt, now he's like managing grunts. He's managing a whole lot of crazy shit, like airplanes and tanks and shit. He's a manager, he manages little teams. Right. And I say to him, okay, cool. You know, you go to boot camp, you get your training, now, finds himself as a manager. My conversation and advice to him was study management. Read as many management books as you can. Books for, that they recommend in the Marines about management. Books that are outside of Marines. I'll send you a couple of me, uh, uh, books. But focus on being a manager. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he acknowledged that. But then very quickly, you know, he's 19 years old, 20 years old. Very quickly, he went to, but get this, Uncle Elliot. When I get out of the Marines, I'm gonna be able. To, I'm gonna be able to use that and build my own business. He starts thinking about building his own business when he gets out of Marines. Mm. I said, Ah! Don't think about that. Get that out of your head completely. You're gonna fucking distract yourself and you're gonna water down your efforts. 
If that's to be, good. Let it come to you. Now, be a great fucking manager. Be the best manager the Marine has ever seen. Max out your education in terms of management. Be right where you are. Let that come. So many times, we as men, with all of the pressures that we have, we're so busy trying to get to the next thing. What's gonna happen next? How am I gonna take care of it when I get there? How, and try to manipulate shit that's in the fucking future that doesn't even exist anymore. But meanwhile, Jordan Peterson likes to say, make your bed, clean your room, take care of what's in front of you. You have a job right now. Don't ignore your job, start doing a shitty job at your job because you're trying to build a business five years from now. Or, you, or, or you're trying to get there before you're supposed to get there. Do, and this is what comes straight from my father, do what's in front of you every single day and you will be okay. Just do what's there. So many untapped opportunities are present in the very moment because we're not in the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, going from that mindset of always having this big thing and now I'm kind of just trying to like, I, I haven't even read my purpose for like months. Because mm, like, you really don't know your purpose. Yeah. You don't know your purpose. I don't know my purpose. <laughs> my purpose is being revealed to me over time, right? I start to see like, it, I could look back now because I'm 41. And I can see what God has been doing with me and is doing through me. So it's a little bit easier for me than you. But still, I don't know what my fucking purpose is. This is where I'm at right now and I'm doing everything that God's asked me to do right now to the best of my ability and so are you. But to formulate and to strive for a ego-determined purpose is fruitless. And a lot of the occult stuff is about bliss. You know, it's about tapping into this blissful state, um, things like that. And I feel like there is a lot of joy also, even just being still and like, even in atonement with the Father, you know? I, I feel that sometimes when I'm just still, there's nothing going on, I feel good. Yeah. So like, this is kind of a multifaceted question, but um, do you, like when you're more atoned with the Father, and you're trying to move forward in your life and you're not trying to be like so rigid with your purpose and all these things and trying to know everything, do you like let that, bliss guide you but because you know like Christianity has like a lot of emphasis on suffering too mm -hmm. so how do you maybe this isn't even a well formulated question but okay I see where you're going with it now you've got a contrast you've got pleasure bliss you got pain suffering the whole idea is to transcend that duality to be above it meaning bliss is here well I'll, I'll be Abdu'l-Baha says, be generous in prosperity and grateful in adversity. Meaning, bliss is here. Don't be attached to bliss. Don't need bliss. Appreciate bliss when it's here. Be generous with your bliss. Offer it, which you have access to. But guaranteed, because life happens in cycles, there's going to be pain. There has to be. And you approach the pain the same exact way you approach the bliss. Pain is here, I'm not gonna resist it, I'm not gonna hanker for bliss, I'm gonna allow myself, ultimately, what this whole conversation is about, being. I'm gonna allow myself to be. I'm gonna suffer in silence. That, one of the things that, biggest problems I see in young men, and I've seen it in myself as a youth, and, and, and I, I mentor to men these days, uh, about this, and I can see it, because I've been there, is this bipolar swing from life is great, everything's going awesome, girls and money, and six months later, I'm fucking depressed, man, and life is not good anymore, and how do I get back to that, right? Yeah. That's because when things were going good, you were giddy, you were emotional, you were proud, you had pride, you were, right? And then when you lose that, it's gone. And that dr I need that again. And I hate this place I'm in. So there's resistance and then there's neediness and you're stuck in this fucked up place in between. When things are good, don't get too excited. When things are painful, don't get too down. Instead of this, we're chaotic. Things are good, acknowledge things are good. Say thank you, thank the Lord. Things are good. Boom. 
things get bad, okay, take a deep breath. This is part of the plan. I can deal with this. And you stay even. So the whole idea is to stay flat. When you stay flat, you're not reaching and you're not pushing. So I've heard criticisms on that kind of mentality of being on an even keel. Like, what if, but doesn't that kind of make you avoid, this is one of the criticisms I heard. Doesn't that make you avoid like a, uh, the polarities of life? No, you can't avoid it. It's going to be there. You're just not attached to it. It's the attachment to it. You're gonna have, you're gonna be very aware that things are going great for you. You get attached from that. Things are fucking great. You're gonna be very aware when things aren't going very well for you. You're gonna, now what begins to happen is the awareness then falls into judgment. And this is where I'm telling you to be careful. Be aware what things are, acknowledge it, verbalize it, be real about what, it, what they are. But then when we start judging, then we have an opinion and we have an opinion, we have, uh, we have resistance against something and reaching for something else. That's the trap that we want to get out of. Emotion, are you following me? Yeah, you're talking about like not being judgmental right. what's going on. Things aren't going well. A judgment would be, man, this sucks. What happened last week? Why am I not like last week? Oh man, this is bad because, and you're gonna start making up reasons why. I stopped meditating. I think I need to meditate. Oh, I stopped reading, that's why. Or uh, I stopped doing deep breathing before I approach girls, that's why. And, you're, and what you're doing here is you're, you're caught back into the mental masturbation of resisting what simply is, mm -hmm. instead of not having a judgment about it. Because if we let God take the wheel, you could dip into negativity and dip right out. You could dip into darkness, because even me calling it negative, positive, good, bad, pleasure, pain, those are all judgments. But we could dip into that which we resist, and you ever heard the term, which you resist persists? Yeah. You could dip into it, and by mere virtue of you resisting it, you trying to fix it, and you're wrestling with it, God's plan was just to dip your toe for a moment and then bring you back up higher. But now, you can't follow God anymore because you're trying to fix it yourself. Right, you're so attached to everything, mm -hmm. right? You're so, yeah. You're, it's the attachment. Attachment is, is where we lose ourselves. Right. Beautiful. Um, I was just thinking I had something there, but kind of fucking went away. I guess God wanted to just put that in and then take it out, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot being thrown it around is. here. It is, um, but uh, to end it off, um, I just want to take a quick look at that list I had just to see if mm -hmm. there's any things on um, I'll probably edit this part out slightly Ooh. after. I like that idea in Catholicism about the mystery of faith. You know, you're not trying to understand it so hard. You yeah. just enjoy the mystery and you're kind of, like you right. said, detached. How freeing is that? Yeah. I don't need to know. You might marvel at yourself for knowing or thinking that you know and being able to cite books and all kinds of fancy words, but I'm at peace. I don't need to know. I learned that one from my father too. My father's like, I don't want to know anything. <laughs> Don't teach me anything. Let me be. <laughs> and his life is made. Are, are we still recording? No, yeah. you, you could be. It's fine. Yeah, yeah it's been recording the whole time. Good. It's funny. Um, the other day, we can make this part of the interview. The other day, um, I met some hippie guy at the beach. And we just randomly started hanging out. And uh, he, <laughs> he said that when I first came up to him, I, I noticed his face kind of went down a little bit or something um i mean he's really caught up in the new age stuff i actually told him that after but um he said something that kind of struck me and he's like i felt like when you came up to me he's talking to me i felt like you were trying to teach me something and he's like i don't want to know anything right now i'm, I'm tired of reading i'm tired of all this shit yeah. <laughs> and i've had that sentiment so many times mm -hmm. these days yeah all this information right um, sometimes i think man i feel like if i just stop reading for the rest of my life yes i'd be fine from this point you would be <laughs> you would be but be selective and choose and this is where the faith in the god of the bible yahweh comes in read the bible 
You gotta this, you gotta eliminate as much as possible, but choose. I don't wanna know one, two, three things. I'm gonna be, because what we have is jack of all trades, and masters of nothing. So I'm gonna read this, this, and that. What I end up doing a lot of times is getting rid of a lot of my books. I just go through and I, and I purge 90% of my books. I give them away. But I keep, I always have a small stash of I'm gonna keep this, this, and this. So it's not a matter of not knowing anything. It's about having the right knowledge, your chosen knowledge, not what the world or your ego wants, but what will be the most beneficial to you when we pass out of this flesh and bone bodysuit. Yeah. Because your soul does go on. So if there's anything to study or to learn or to be well-versed in, it has to be about the salvation of your soul. This body and all knowledge is gonna fall away. Your soul can be headed for eternal life or eternal damnation based on the choices we make. Now that's me, that's the stuff that is worth putting a little bit of your energy towards, <laughs> most of it. So you kind of transitioned from like reincarnation and stuff like that then? Right? Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm just telling you where I'm at right now. Yeah. I don't think about re reincarnation. I don't bother myself with it, whether it's true or not. I just don't even consider it anymore. If you look in the Bible, there's instance of quote unquote reincarnation, but it's a little different. Meaning like when Jesus come, they ask him if he's uh, Elijah. They ask him if he's, uh, you know, from Elijah, uh, the king, the, the throne of David, Moses, like there's a lineage. Right. So to, why would they ask Jesus if he's Elijah? He, they, you know, he had, one time he asked his students, who do you think I am? And some people say you are Elijah. Some people say you're John the Baptist. They say you're John the Baptist or you're Elijah. Well, those guys are, are long dead. Why would they say that unless Jesus was being reincarnated? So there's this idea, let me put it this way. I'm just, because we're brainstorming and I'm, I'm just talking. As far as reincarnation is, con reincarnation is concerned, the way it can be seen is that there'll never be another you. Absolutely 100% will never be another you, but there will be other versions of you that come as a particular form on this planet, uh, uh, archetype on this planet. When Jesus says that he'll return, he's not necessarily, he already rose from the dead in his, his physical body, but he's probably not gonna come back looking the way we have him painted up to look. He'll come back, but it'll be still be Jesus. I'm talking a whole lot of shit right now, I should probably stop. I, I'm, I'm, I don't even know what I'm talking about. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, I don't, I don't even wrap my mind around that shit anymore. I think in terms of this is it, this is all I'll be, and eternal life is before I was, into, was in this flesh suit and after I leave this flesh suit. It's the spiritual body. It's not the thinking body, because you got four bodies. You got spiritual, you got thinking, you got emotional, and you got physical. Right. And so it's the spiritual body. It comes in and out of form. Right, and I have like one Everything last... I just said there didn't make any sense. In my own mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm talking too long. Like, I have one last question, sort of. <laughs> yeah. One last discussion topic or question. And mm -hmm. then I was thinking maybe we could end it with like a like a drill of some sort. Let's, let's wrap it up with something cool. Yeah. i make up for that weird answer. <laughs> um, a lot of guys that are listening, and plus a lot of how the world is moving now, um, people are spending more and more time on computer. Uh, a lot of people are working remotely. Yeah. You know, with COVID and everything, especially a lot of jobs, or a lot of companies are like, all right, let's get people to work more remotely, this and that. Yeah. And I, dip my toes into some software engineering and stuff like that and man it was like depressing because like I would do it and then I felt like a fucking shell of a man afterwards I'd spent six hours in front of a computer and I was so in my head analyzing all this stuff you know and then I come out and I feel I, I didn't feel good right you know and that's kind of what turned me off to tech and everything yeah but I still see like maybe I might, might get back into it but what do you think that's doing to like people and when, they, when they're working on, the, on their computers so much and that they're just in their heads or they're coding and they're, mm -hmm. 
Is that kind of like ungrounded, or can you can you do it's a lot of fake? We've been we've been taught to live in an avatar world, a made up world. Instagram is your you even call it your avatar. Right. It's who I'm presenting myself to be in this fictional world called the internet. And so a part of that bad feeling that you're getting is that you're investing into something that's fake. It's technology, it's tools. I do believe that the backdrop behind the release of these tools is for control from the puppet masters up top. A lot of it is knowledge that, and I'm gonna get real weird as if I haven't been weird already, but a lot of it is knowledge that has been given to us from, there are, if you search the news, they're admitting extraterrestrial contact right we've gotten knowledge we've gotten technology from extraterrestrials and this technology all of it the whole internet is a grid designed specifically to control it has liberated us got us addicted to it but ultimately what it's going to boil down to is they're already doing it. if you look up nasara and jasara and this worldwide economic reset all of our currency is going to go digital so not only is your personality in this fake world, but now your access to the real world, which is becoming more and more as we speak, is gonna be a tie to your fake self, your avatar self. The reason why that's important to the people who are in control is that if they have a database of avatar selves that are under the control of a minority that chooses who gets to buy and sell, then powers consi consistently consolidated in the evil minority. So again, like it's so funny, you have an apple, you have an apple, on the back of that apple is the, is the apple bitten by Eve. That's what that apple is about. It's us biting into, taking on, going into this essentially demonic world of tech. The tech world is an imaginary demonic world designed for control. The, the, the few, control the many. So we're gonna to get to a point, the read revelations, and we're probably there right now, where this actually ends up becoming the mark of the beast. Do you accept your global identification certificate? Have you signed on and that avatar is you, and now you can operate in that and in the world only through that identification? You don't exist without your digital identification. This is where we're going. Right. So what I believe the market of beast ultimately is, isn't a chip in our hand, that's just tech, that's just hard tech. Isn't that necessarily, but it gets us there, but it's our addiction to the access that that gives us. And it's all, I, I know I sound like Alex Jones too, but Alex Jones talks a lot about this. Basically a, he uses the word avatar, but like a fake world in the sky where everyone's represented by an by a digital icon, and you are literally just like our social security number. You're literally your social security number because of the people that in the old world, because we're moving into the new world, uh, that own you because you got to pay taxes. That's how they own your money through your social security number. Social security number is, is issued by the Federal Reserve Bank. If you look at your social security card you're basically owned by the bank. You're collateral for our government to the banks for all of our debt. That's a fact. But, but now that the Federal Reserve has been brought into the National Treasury, Treasury and there's this plan for a global economic reset and the Federal Reserve will be abolished, is gonna move into a worldwide digital currency that now is not your social security number, which is just a number, it's your online identification avatar. And you have to play by the rules to maintain good standing for your online digital avatar. Otherwise, you don't get food. You don't get to travel. Right. Kind of reminds me of like the Chinese ranking system. It's whatever. exactly what it is. We're adopting it from China. This is what's coming. This is what the powers to be want. And like part of, part of the question too was like the way that I feel, and a lot of guys I'm sure can relate to this, um, when they're coding or spending all this time on a, on a computer, and they're no longer grounded. I guess what I'm saying is, um, like, if you want to live a masculine life, you don't want to spend 40 to 60 hours a week in your in your fucking head, completely disconnected and cut off from yourself. All right. That's kind of how I felt. I'm like, man, I feel. But that's our default because what did they teach us in school? Eight hours a day, sit down, facing the book, face up at the board. Now my kids, they have iPads at school, so we're conditioned 
to be addicted to that way of being and the technology behind it. So society is being, uh, we're being uh, molded, we're being manipulated, we're being drawn into this more easily controllable creature. To be, an un to be a free creature, ultimately, we have to drop all that and mobile on. You see what I'm saying? You've got to drop all that and get back into nature. Get back into your, what I would say, for a man, have a family. For a woman, don't get a fucking career. I'm against women working out into the workforce. I sound like a misogynist, but it's a part of the, the deep-rooted conditioning that has, has us led astray. Woman, have babies. Care for your babies. Father, lead your home. Educate your wife, educate your children. Have your children work in the home, grow stuff. Do things in nature. We gotta come back first and foremost to ourselves, like the beginning of our conversation, but then what's most important beyond uh, you know, our connection to self and God is family, 100%. Postmodernism has us hating family. People don't have babies anymore, people don't get married anymore, there's good reason why, I understand. But ultimately, what we're here to do to be fruitful and multiply, raise good families. Or even tribes of men, right? That's where it will ultimately be. Right. Tribes of fa families of families, extended family. We hate family. The West, the world, hates the family. The reason why it wants to destroy the family is because it, hate, it wants to topple the leadership or the lordship of God the Father. The way you topple the leadership of God the Father is by removing the Father Father from the home. So this whole push towards, like if you look at Black Lives Matter, the whole movement is a feminist movement. It is not about black lives. It's not about black men being killed. If you go on their website and you'll see, it's about the evolution of the family. They're adamantly in, on their website against quote unquote patriarchy. Mm. They are for the redefining of the family. How do you redefine the family? Get fathers the fuck out of it. How do you do that? Make men weak. Beautiful, beautiful. And with that being said, um, I wanted to end it with like a drill, a ritual, something that, I don't know if something is coming to you right now, maybe some kind of bioenergetics, something to make men strong. That was the last sentence you said, make, make men weak were your last words. And uh, how do we, do something right now to just get back into our bodies should we do like a primal scream should we do a fucking breathing thing what do you think i propose that we say the lord's prayer the lord's prayer it is then that's what i propose. you know it is it the the orthodox one like the lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on me no our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The only prayer that Jesus taught us. I'll lead you through it. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it, it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Yeah, there's a lot of power in that prayer. And it brings us right back to the root of what we're dealing with there. Um, I still feel like we should at least fucking do one. Then you lead me. What are we doing? Because that's what I started with when I got into your work. So we're going to do, at the count of three, a fucking primal scream straight from the balls. I got to stand up. Let's do it. And then that's what we'll end it on. All right, cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the count of three, and together, just one fucking, just straight from the balls, man. Okay, here, let me turn around. Turn around, buddy. <clears throat> and also, Elliot, <clears throat> I just want to hug you before this. Oh, man. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Huge brother. influence. This Elliot. was fun. Yeah, yeah. I was doing a little ranting today, but I had a good time. No, it was great. Turn around. So, we're, just, we're doing a what? Doing for the okay, basketball. guys, primal. Three, two, one.